um, administrative duties, and I'm also responsible for um, the enforcement uni units in housing, employment, and public accommodations. We have 13 investigators, eight of them are employment investigators. Um, they investigate employment and public accommodation. And we have five investigators for housing and three support staff. And this covers the state of Tennessee. This project, um, along with the one we did earlier in April, um, is conducted under a partnership funds from the HUD, US Department of Housing and Urban Development. We are substantially equivalent, so they are able to provide us partnership funds through the Memorandum of Understanding, which allows us to do these educational um, events for you. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website um, for future reference. So the agenda for today, we're going to talk about the commission itself, the state and federal laws, the complaint process. I'll also provide you with case examples some statistics, and uh, best practices. So let's jump right in. In September of 1963, Governor Frank Clement signed the Executive Order 18, creating the Tennessee Relations Commission. The purpose of that commission was to advise the public on their human rights, do some researching, and make reports on human relations to the governor. In 1978, the Tennessee Human Rights Act was established, and it transformed the commission from an advisory agency into an enforcement agency. Jocelyn Wurzberg of Memphis, Tennessee, was the author of the, re of the legislation and was very critical in its passage. A year later, we had the Tennessee Disability Act of 1979, which established disability in employment, and in 1984, THRC, the THRA was amended to include housing. So the Tennessee Human Rights Act, it prohibits discrimination in employment, public accommodation, and housing based on race, color, national origin, gender, including pregnancy, age is an employment only, religion, creed, familial status is housing only, and we have retaliation. All in all, we have, between the two laws, we have nine protected classes and retaliation. In 1983, the commission's name was officially changed to the Tennessee Human Rights Act. We currently have a nine-member board, two members being appointed by the leadership from the Senate and two from the House, and five are appointed by the governor. We have the 29 staff that are located in four offices, the central office being Nashville. We have two investigators in Memphis, two in Chattanooga, and five housing investigators located in Knoxville. Our mission is to safeguard individuals from discrimination through enforcement and education. So overall, the commission is a neutral investigative agency that investigates and litigates when necessary employment, housing, and public accommodation discrimination complaints that are filed in Tennessee. And we also monitor state governmental entities um, with compliance for Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We are the substantial equivalent to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 for Title VII and 1968 for Title VIII which is affectionately known as the Fair Housing Act. This is where we'll spend most of our time is in the Fair Housing Act because it is April when it was signed. So the Tennessee Fair Housing Act and, and the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination in sale, rental, and financing of housing based on home seekers, memberships in a protected class. THRE also includes commercial property, and what this does is it's kind of like if you purchase land for hunting purposes, um, you would fall under our law if, you, if there's discriminatory. So who, who must comply with these laws? So any housing provider with one dwelling would fall under the THRA. 
or four or more units for Fair Housing Act. This may include individual landlords, corporations, associations, that includes HOAs and condo associations, properties or housing managers, lenders, real estate agents, and brokerage services. What is prohibited? When we say sale and rental of housing, you cannot take negative action based on the protected class. So you can't refuse to rent or sell. You can't refuse to provide information regarding a loan. Um, you can't impose uh, different terms or conditions or privileges for the sale or rental of the dwelling or provide um, wrong information on the facilities. Um, you can't you can't falsely say that housing is available for inspection or sale and doing all of these actions based on the protected the protected class in the mortgage lending the same type of thing you can't refuse to make a mortgage loan uh, based on the protected class or refuse to provide information or impose different terms or conditions on the loan interest rates points we kind of saw a lot of this in 2008 with the housing crisis around this, these areas. Uh, discrimination in appraising property. Refuse to purchase a loan or set different terms for purchasing the loan. It's also illegal for anybody to threaten or coerce. So this basically is talking about retaliation um, for someone who either filed a complaint or um, operated in some right or was a witness or participated in an investigation. You can't retaliate against them. Nor can you advertise or make any statements that indicate a limitation or a preference based on the protected class. So you could not advertise and say a nice two-bedroom home for a Christian family without children. That would be in violation. We're going to talk about some exemptions later on. If you find yourself that you are exempt, if, if there is discriminatory advertising, you would come out from under the exemption. So who is covered? Tennessee Human Rights Act and the Fair Housing Act protects all people against discrimination, regardless of their legal status in the United States. So immigrants are covered by the Act. Um, there is an express it expressly prohibits discrimination based on national origin. So we're going to talk about the protected classes. So race discrimination, it falls under race, which is the federal categories of Caucasian, African American, American Indian, or Alaska Native. And those kind of come up as a collection or a classification of people who identify each other based on similarities or social cultures. You have Asian, Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and then the new category of multi multiracial. Color, um, we, we don't see this as much being as um, a protected class that a complaint is filed upon, but it's still in our law and it does cover it. And what it's looking at is the difference between the skin color or the tone of the skin between the light, like a light skin or dark skin person of the same race. Sometimes they can be treated differently. National origin. Um, this is being treated differently from because you're from a different country or you have an accent or you're perceived to be from a different country. You don't have to be, but your ancestor come from a different country, and that would, that would um, count under national origin. So here's some examples. An Asian female visits the complex because she saw a sign for rent. The manager tells her it's already been rented, but days later the sign is still posted. So she could file a complaint saying that she believed that the manager told her it was already rented because she was Asian. The next one, the manager or the property tells an African-American male 
I'm sure you would feel more at home in another neighborhood. This again can, can cause them to feel that they were discriminated because of their, because of their race. And a property owner makes a comment to a Mexican male, do you think that you can afford this neighborhood? So discrimination on religion, um, you can't discriminate or deny housing to a person because of their religion, including persons that choose not to have a religion. So an atheist or any kind of just non-religious person, you cannot um, say this is for Christians only. Discrimination based on gender. Now this has kind of been a hot topic of late. Tennessee is a state that says your gender is whatever is stated on your birth certificate. So with all of the new bathroom bills that are occurring in the different states, there's an increased discussion on how to change your birth certificate to be in line with what the person's gender choice is. So we'll have to wait and see how this turns out. But right now, Tennessee says whatever is on your birth certificate is the gender that that you must go by. So with gender discrimination is also sexual harassment. And sexual harassment, as we all know, is unwelcome verbal or physical conduct based on one or more of the protected classes. There's two ways that we look to investigate this. One is hostile environment, which you're looking to see if what is being said to that person interferes with their ability to enjoy their housing. The second way is to look at quid pro quo, and that is Latin term meaning this for that. And um, basically is um, you're subjected to that, to that um, conduct uh, as based on a housing decision. So some examples of that is I'll fix your sink if you dot dot dot. Or I'm evicting you because you never came over to have drinks with me or I'll give you $50 off your rent if you'll go out with me. We find these mostly come in the housing department. Um, it's usually by one of the housing agents, not like the direct landlord, but a maintenance person or something of that nature. Familial status. Um, this protects any parent or any person having legal custody or who are in the process of securing custody of an 18 year old. Um, so this includes foster children, adoption, temporary custody, and even children visiting. So it's basically if there is a child under the age of 18 and including pregnancy, that would you would file under familiar status. Disability. Um, disability is a person um, who is, is denied housing because of their disability and they have to be qualified and what does it mean to be qualified it's a person has a physical or mental condition that substantially limits one or more of its life activities like breathing walking talking um, it includes people who have a record of such impairment and or are regarded as having one um, and so the landlord can't take any actions if based on the disability. And this includes two other um, points on this, is reasonable mod modifications and reasonable accommodations. But neither one of those come into play unless you have established a disability. So a reasonable mo modification really is just a structural alterations to the building. So a landlord, um, can ask, well, if a person requests a modification like raising of cabinets in an apartment so that they can get their wheelchair underneath it or something like that, um, it's really whatever is necessary to afford the full enjoyment of, of the premises. So these modifications are done usually at the, at the expense of the person with the disability unless it is a federally funded property and then the landlord would take care of it. But any adjustments to the structural building 
Um, it may be required to be restored once the person leaves, but usually it's an enhancement to the building and the property does, is not returned. Reasonable accommodation. Now this is more of a change in, this is what we most commonly see. Um, it's a change in policy or a practice that allows the person with a disability to fully enjoy their home. And this even goes out to the common spaces. So the most questions that we get are reasonable accommodations of why. Why should a housing provider um, accommodate a person with a disability? And you're really treating the person with a disability the same as others. And it's sometimes by denying that you, will, you limit their equal opportunity to enjoy their dwelling. So you really, each policy and each services has a different effect on a person with a disability. So you really have to talk to them to find out what it is that they are, they are asking. So some examples of that, like I said before, allowing the kitchen cabinets to be lowered in a unit, um, adding a ramp for access to the unit, being able to pay your rent on the, on the second Tuesday of the month instead of the first because you're receiving a disability check. Um, an exception to the bereaved policy for emotional support animals. So what makes an accommodation reasonable? That's the other questions we get. And the answer is it depends. The accommodation request must relate to the individual's disability. So if I um, if my arm is broken and or amputated and I have and I'm considered a person with a disability but I'm asking for a parking spot closer to my building, that doesn't quite relate to your disability. So you would have to try to figure out why you need a spot. Mostly the parking spots are for people who have mobility issues and they can't walk over 200 yards. So it just depends. Another question that we receive is how can I deny it or can I deny a reasonable accommodation? Well, there's two reasons how you can deny. If the accommodation request will impose an undue financial hardship or administrative burden on the housing provider, then the accommodation is not reasonable. Now, the courts have a high threshold of what is undue hardship. Um, <clears throat> so, if it's reasonable and you're able to do it, it's best to go ahead and provide the reason, reasonable accommodation. The other one, if it fundamentally alters the nature of the provider's operation, then you can deny that. So, an example of that request, which can be unreasonable, is a request to pay zero or reduced rent because of my disability. I don't really see anything that can make that connection to the disability for that to be a reasonable accommodation. So that could be something that you could deny. Others ask about breaking codes. Like what if, you're, what if your local law prohibits certain requests for accommodations? Do you still need to provide that accommodation? And again, it depends. You need to do the test of whether the request is reasonable. If it is, then you make the request, even if there is a local law prohibiting it. And that's usually because such laws are kind of antiquated and they need to be updated. So it's better to err on the side, if it's reasonable, to make the request. So this has kind of been a topic where people are, uh, need more information on support and comfort animals. Under the Fair Housing Act, all kinds of animals can assist people with disabilities in their housing. It does not have to be a dog. It can be a cat. And we've even seen a snake um, that provides companionship. The animal does not have to be trained or have certification as an assistant animal. But the tenant must be able to demonstrate that the animal is necessary and can provide the functions that the tenant requires. The housing provider can, can insist that the animal be well-behaved, vaccinated, and being cleaned up after, but they cannot 
stipulate what the animal is. It is also unlawful to provide, um, to require a pet fee for an assisted animal. One, because it's not a pet. You have to look at it as it is helping the um, person with a disability adjust and, and live. Very much like a person who utilizes a wheelchair needs that wheelchair in order to operate. So you have to look at that pet similar to that and then it kind of makes sense. Um, there is no breed, size, or weight limitation at this time. Um, so you can't stereotype a breed like a Rockwaller or something like that saying it's a vicious animal. You have to look at it on an individualized basis to assess that animal's actual conduct. So if that animal has not had any uh, previous uh, destructive actions, then you must allow it. As a reasonable accommodation. So the investigative process. So THRC receives a complaint and we first review it to make sure it's jurisdictional for us and if it's jurisdictional then we'll accept the complaint and notify the complainant. We'll also notify um, what we say the violator, the alleged violator of the complaint and allow that person to submit a response. We investigate the complaint and determine whether there is reasonable cause to believe that a violation occurred of the acts. Then we'll notify them also if the complaint is going to take 100 days of receiving the complaint. And this comes from a HUD standard that we have under our mem memorandum of understanding that says we have to complete cases, 50% of our cases should be completed in 100 days or less. And if we can't do that, then we must notify um, the complainant and let them know why. So jurisdictional elements that we look for is standing. The complainant must have standing that they have been or will be injured by the discriminatory practice. So. Um, they may, they have been refused um, to, to rent an apartment. Um, it must be timely within 180 days of the most recent act of harm. Um, for HUD, it's 365 days. Uh, we must have jurisdiction over the property or the owner, and they're not exempt. Again, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. And then the subject matter must violate the act. So refusal to sell based on a protected class. If it doesn't have these things, and for us we need original signature, if it doesn't have these things, then it would not be jurisdictional. So all these things must be met. So these are the exemptions. So this the, the TCA 421-602 is outlined here. It basically means on this first one, that we look at it as a duplex. If, you, if the owner or his family member lives in the duplex, then renting the other side, if, uh, they can choose who they'd like to be in the other side. And they would not come under our act or the Fair Housing Act. The second one talks about if I'm in a house and there's common rooms or roomings that you're renting out, inside your house and you have to share a common bathroom, then you would not fall under the both of our acts. Religious organizations are also exempt. If they have like a specific housing um, complex where you either have to attend their church or be part of their faith in order to rent that, then they would be exempt as well. Universities um, who have designated um, sex dormitories for rent, they would be exempt from our law as well. And also el elderly housing um, for the 62 or older or the 55 and older, it must be approved by the HUD secretary. They must have that designation. Um, they would also be exempt. So our basic approach to investigations are we interview the complainant and find out exactly what happened. You know, usually they have something written up 
but we need to ask more questions and do a full interview. And then there's a process that we call conciliation in, in housing. And this really is, is there anything that you can put forward that could help resolve your complaint? So a person is injured and then we want to find out what's basically going to make you whole. And they'll provide terms like, I just really would like to get out of my, my lease without having to pay the cost of it. And, and so you take that, the investigator can sh basically shuttle those offers back to the, to the respondent and see if you can come to terms. If you come to terms, then we call that a conciliation agreement and there's no investigation, there's no, um, there's no, uh, nobody is saying that they discriminated. It's just a, a way to resolve the complaint without investigation. So that's always asked for at least twice through the investigative process. Then we notify the respondent and we also ask for data requests. Depending on what the complaint is about, we'll ask for tenant records or um, things of that nature, you know, lease agreements, that kind of stuff. The investigator will do an investigative plan, and this is a plan to show exactly which way we need to go based on our standards of law, what we need to ask for, who, who we might talk to, basically outlines the entire investigation. We will interview the respondent and we'll also ask for conciliation terms on their end. This TCA code, the 421-308, it gives us um, access to your records. So you can't say, no, I can't share that with you, it's confidential. Um, this gives us authority to ask for those records and you're able to provide those to us. In the investigation plan, you may decide to do an on-site. Um, that's actually going out and visiting the properties. As we talked about earlier, we have five employees that do housing full-time and they are located in Knoxville and they cover the state of Tennessee. So as you can see, we do a lot of our investigations and, and do a lot of our interviews via the phone and but sometimes we have to go on site so we'll um, We'll get in the car and drive across the state if we have to. Um, those are usually when we need to see a property um, or the respondent is fails to give us the information and then we come on site and talk to the tenants ourselves, knock on doors, um, go to the office and view the records as we need to, um, that kind of stuff. We'll interview witnesses um, that are in that live at the apartment that may be under the same uh, situation as the complainant so that we can see how they were treated and to see if the respondent applied its policies across the board. And once we have gathered all of our facts and we feel like we have talked to everybody that we need to, we'll do an analysis of what we have against the standard of law and then um, we'll make a decision. And if we have any holes or we have a further questions, we'll do a rebuttal interview with complainant and respondent, and then we'll make a, a make a final determination. If we find that there was no violation, um, then we just write up our investigative notes and um, it's reviewed by uh, two other levels in our agency, and then we close the case and then both parties are notified of the results and they're also given appeal rights. So you can appeal back to us as a reconsideration and a different attorney will review the investigation and ask for more information if necessary or you can take it into a state or chancery court. So all of our case information is confidential prior to any hearings that we would go to and the hearings would start once we found that there was a violation of the law. Once we find, after all of our fact gathering, and we find that there is a violation or there is discrimination, we will offer conciliation once again with those facts on the table stating this is a violation and can we come to a resolution. 
if it settles and the case is closed and we just put it into a monetary a monitor monitoring term and just to follow up and make sure that you're still in compliance as a landlord. If the conciliation fails, then the case is set for the administrative hearing before an administrative law judge. And the remedies can be, uh, we do do compensatory damages, um, humiliation and embarrassment for costs. So all those fees could be racked up and applied to you as the, as the violator. The first fine is up to $10,000. The second offense is $25,000 and then $50,000 for the third offense. So it could be kind of costly for violations. So I wanted to kind of give you some case examples of what we've seen. So in this case, um, this was a disability case, and uh, the rent was due on the first day of the month, and if it was not paid by the fifth day, then there was a $50 late fee incurred. So the complainant was unable to work and all she had was social security income, but that check did not come to her until the second Wednesday of each month. So she wanted to avoid late fees, so she verbally asked the respondent if she could move her due date of rent to the second Wednesday when she received her check as a reasonable accommodation. She alleges that the respondent did not respond and continued to apply the $50 late fee. So she incurred a lot of a lot of debt over that. So she also said that she put it in writing to him, which is not necessary, it can be verbal, um, and he still failed to respond and she continued to get the, the late fees. So when we received the complaint, um, we reached out to the complaint, and we reached out to the respondent and we didn't have much success. Every time we called on the phone, it would answer, we would identify ourselves, and then it would disconnect. And we weren't able to get a reply. But then, a couple of months later, we heard from the complainant, and she had received a letter from the respondent indicating that her rent had increased. And so, where she had initially filed on just disability reasonable accommodation, um, with this new evidence that came in, we were able to amend the complaint and add retaliation. So after the investigation of this, this one actually closed um, as a conciliation agreement. And I don't know, um, it did close as a conciliation agreement, but it was after we caused the case. Um, we had enough evidence that he denied or delayed her reasonable accommodation, so we were able to cause the case. The accommodation was reasonable to be able to delay the, um, the payment of rent. And so in post-cause conciliation agreement, um, the complainant received $5,000 in monetary benefits and a written apology. The respondent also had to complete fair housing training, so he was aware of the laws and pay $2,000 to the commission for reimbursement of filing the case. So the second case, it was also disability. And by the way, we receive about 56% of our cases are disability related at this point. Um, so this was a physical disability and she had um, an adverse effect to tobacco smoke. So her reasonable accommodation was that she had she asked the respondents to turn the entire complex into a smoke-free um, building or that they designate certain apartments um, to not to, to units as non-smokers. And she also asked that if they couldn't do that then to make sure that they checked her building to make sure there was no leakage, air leakage, or weather stripping and caulk, and caulk their whole entire apartment. So during the investigation, the, the respondent 
so that they had received the accommodation request. They took it seriously. They took it to their board and it was declined to have to have a, a, a whole complex be designated as non-smoking because it affected too many of the other people to lose, to lose their freedom. And they also responded to checking their apartment to make sure that the, um, the airways and the transfer, tra transference of air was, was reasonable and, and that there wasn't any leakage to be able to get smoke into the apartment. And, um, and tried other alternatives without success. So during the investigation, you know, we found that, yes, they did take it under consideration. They, they tried to do um, HVAC system minimizing the smoke and did caulking and, and such things to handle everything properly. So this, this case closed as no cause because the respondents were responsive to everything that they had and the reasonable accommodation was was not reasonable at that time so so that one ended as a no cause the last case we'll talk about um, the complainant alleged that um, one of the staff members or the agent for the respondent um, called her son the N-word on a regular basis. Um, they filed a complaint internally with, with the management company and there was no action taken. Um, after that complaint, she felt like she was receiving unfair treatment in the reading of her lease and had... Um, Instead of being renewed on July 1, they were asking for the agreement to be renewed a month earlier. It wasn't consistent with what had happened last year. And she just felt that all of this stuff was, was happening because she had filed the internal complaint. Um, and also she had received a letter for um, a raise in her, in her rent. So during the investigation, um, we spoke with the respondents and they said that they had a policy that unequivocally prohibited discrimination based on our protected classes as well as sexual orientation and marital status. Um, they, you know, gave a reasonable explanation about the misunderstanding of the uh, complainant's lease and provided all the times that they had attempted to remedy the situation. And they stated, <laughs> they kind of, you know, stood away from from the um, from the from the staff member that supposedly had called, used the N word, and said, you know, if it's true, it was outside of his scope of employment, and so they therefore they could not be held liable. In this case, you know, after we did our investigation, it went into conciliation terms prior to us finish the investigation. And the outcome of this case, it was mediated, and the complainant received $25,000 and was released from her rental agreement early without penalty. So those are some of the things that we see. Um, I wanted to give you the statistics in an overall for the last two fiscal years. So in 2015, we received 265 inquiries. This is just in housing. And we were able to file 152 of those that met those jurisdictional standards. And in this past year, we had an increase of inquiries up to 382, but it looks like we filed just a little bit less um, in the actual complaints filed. We were able to close 112 complaints in 15, and in 16, we were able to close 80 complaints. And this, some of this was due to the lower in 2016 was due to some staff turnover. In 15, we were able to settle 45 complaints, resulting in $63,000 in, in benefits to the complaint, monetary benefits. And then this past year, we settled 33 complaints, resulting in about $40,300. $300 in monetary benefits. It's not always monetary. We have non-monetary benefits such as reinstating a lease or granting accommodation 
as well as requiring training for the landlord and the staff. So lots of, you know, we can be creative in this area to be able to resolve the complaints. And so it's not always money. So here's just some reminders about the fair housing laws. If you receive a reasonable accommodation for a support animal, you cannot charge a pet fee. One, it's not a pet, and but you can charge for any damages that act just like on anybody else. If the apartment is damaged, you can charge um, a fee to recoup and, and fix the place. Um, you want to make sure if, if somebody has a support animal that they're able to go throughout the property, even the common areas. That is being used, similar to a wheelchair, to assist them with their disability. You want to make sure that when you receive an, a, a, an accommodation request for an animal that's not specifically trained or certified, you don't just automatically refuse it. You want to go into what's called an interactive conversation with them to make sure it's something that falls under the law and um, it is reasonable. Um, do, align, do allow assignments to reserve parking for tenants with disability who, ha who have mobility issues and it's connected to their, to their disability. So here's the biggest thing is just be responsive. If you receive it, try not to delay. Address it head on. If you're unsure, reach out to our agency if you have questions. Um, but the biggest thing is don't just flat out deny it or ignore it or say it's unreasonable without having that interactive discussion. Um, the person with the disability knows what they need um, and you just need to make sure uh, it, it's, it's reasonable and you guys can come to an understanding. Uh, housing providers, you should have written policies that govern how you handle tenant complaints. All of your employees should be trained on the practice and policies and they should be distributed to your tenants. Um, the policies should be applied consistently to all tenants regardless of the membership in the protected class. So those are kind of the things that are best practices that can help you should a complaint come against you if these things are in order, like I showed in the one example, and you walk through your policy and apply it across the board, then you'll be okay. So that's my presentation. I want to open it up for questions. Um, again, if you're going to ask a question, you need to use the chat box and type out your question and we'll try to get as much as we can answered while we're online. If we cannot answer it or we need to do a little more research then we'll send the, we'll send the question and the, and the response out to the participant. So any questions? I will be speaking tomorrow at the Tennessee Fair Housing Matters Conference. It starts at 8 o'clock. It is in the, at the embassy, this is the embassy suite at the National Airport. So if you haven't signed up for that, that's a good place to hear other people speak about the fair housing law as we go through this April month. I do not see any questions at this time. Okay. Also, at the end of this, we're going to be sending out a survey for you to fill out for us as part of the partnership funds that we receive from HUD. They ask us to get some response from our participants. So it would be very helpful if you can turn that around and get back get that back to us so that we can report to HUD how this information has been disseminated. 
seeing seeing no questions. If you have something later, you can write in to Erica Wynn, um, who was sending you all of our links, and you can write a question in, um, and we'll respond to that as well. Again, this was recorded, and it will be uh, up on our website for future reference. Thank you, and have a good day.